Um, throughout history, society uh, in general, if we think about society, the world, has changed the way we view what happens in the world. What people think and the way people act are a couple of things that have changed drastically. Where things were once simple for us to understand, the fact from the fiction, the black from the white, the right from the wrong, they aren't so quite clear anymore. Think about it for a second. Take a moment. Is that light annoying you guys? Aaron, do you want to flick up there and grab that light? Um, I don't want... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just see it on you. Um, you're beautiful men, but you don't need to be in the spotlight. Uh, you think about the things that, are, that, that we have in our world today that, that no longer or that we don't think about the same. Once upon a time, we used to think the world is flat. Anyone who's flown in a plane uh, to England will know that the world is not flat, right? Otherwise, you would have flown off the other end of the world. You would have. You had to go round. What? <laughs> no, that's not far enough. Um, uh, what about thinking about um, once we actually uh, feared drivers in cars? You know, when you used to ride your horse down Perry Street and we used to see this motor vehicle coming, we used to fear drivers in cars. What is this driver going to do? Because they had no idea how to control a motor car. What do we fear nowadays? Driverless cars. Cars without even any vehicles and that, uh, any people, and that is coming. What about this one? And this one hits home to us and it's very real. It was once never okay to live with your partner before marriage. Now it's considered norm. The way we view the world has been changed and it is changing us. But while all these things, changes seems to happen, throughout the centuries, the church seems to have been this steadying rock, if you like. To some mixed reviews, people think it's archaic thinking, old thinking, you know, needs to be updated, changed. But throughout it, the church was steady, a steadying factor. Unwavering in its right from wrong, in its actions and its judgments. Yet this too is now changing. We as a church are now being asked to make decisions that we at once that, that we would never have been asked to make. And decisions that seem to compromise our very belief system. So coming back from furlough and fresh with somewhat energetic uh, thought and mind, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to crack into our, um, our doctrines. These foundational statements that we have that hold us uh, as, um, that, that, that underpin everything that we do here uh, as a core, the way that we act um, and the, the thoughts that we have and the, the, the desires that we have in our hearts and that we want to share with other people. In the wider church, these statements are often referred to as, as I've just said, doctrines, which comes from the Latin word doctrina, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but it simply means meaning, uh, it means teaching or instruction. So these are the teachings and the instructions of the church. One of the very first uh, Christian doctrines that's recorded in the Bible comes from 1 Corinthians 12, 3, and it's simply this, Jesus is Lord. You want to read that, say that with me? Jesus is Lord. It was the way the earliest Christians used to interact with each other and acknowledge one another in this simple, basic confession and doctrine. It stood as a constant reminder towards the truth. Over the years, though, as the Christian church has grown, thank goodness for that, so did divisions of belief. We started to look a little bit deta more detail. What did things mean and explored them and tried to pull them out and wrestle with them in our own brains. And so these statements have been adapted, added to, subtracted from, completely reworded throughout the centuries by the church and by many councils of wise men, individual biblical scholars and saints, but all done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, over the years, the church hasn't got this perfect. I mean, we're humans, right? Right? And we're trying to describe in words how almighty and powerful our God is. 
how he interacts with the world and how he uh, would like us to interact with him. But with the Holy Spirit guidance, scholarly study and prayer of scriptures, and indeed a healthy dose of wisdom from Christian tradition, our past, the Christian church ended up with what is known as 10 mainstream doctrines that spoke of God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, man, salvation, the church, scriptures, angels, Satan, and last things. In 1878, the church, uh, when our founder, William Booth, um, changed the name of this church, the Salvation Army, from the Christian Mission to the Salvation Army, the place where you're worshipping here today, he took some of the scriptural truths that he learned um, as a boy and as a minister uh, in the Methodist Connection, New Connection Movement, and some of his own thoughts about Scripture and how that should be applied and, and, and understandings of God and wrote down what we now know as the 11, uh, Salvation Army's 11 Articles of Faith. And I'm not gonna ask you to memorise or if anyone knows them off by heart because even as an officer, I don't know them off by heart, but I do know where to find them. And so they're found in any songbook, which nowadays is propping up a Bible it's always handy to have a songbook handy. They're in the back of the songbook if you want to find one. Uh, they're down the back of the hall where Sarah is now on the table as you came in this morning, um, which we've printed out for you to have. Or they're located online, which are pretty easily to find as well. They're very readily available. These articles of faith or doctrine uh, underpin us as a core. And all of those like us across the 137, 139, 141, whatever country number we're up to now, um, that we have, uh, let's say, infiltrated. A mainstream, these are mainstream Christian beliefs that have expressed, that have been expressed over the centuries. And so those 10 main uh, Christian doctrine statements align very similar uh, with those of the Salvation Army. And even today, 144 years later, since Williams first penned them down, they still guide our thoughts, our actions, our teachings and the hopes that we have here. I think it's pretty safe to say though that we don't, as individuals who worship within the Salvation Army, might not all agree with the 11 statements of faith and how they're written. And so long as we don't stretch too far from the truth, I think that's actually a good thing that we don't all disagree because with that, as we listen, as we share, as we explore, as we research, our faith actually grows and so does our understanding. But what these 11 statements do do though, is they're like a tent peg in the ground. And they keep us grounded. They keep us coming back to what it is that we're trying to express and believe. And so our first article of faith or our first doctrine is quite simply what the rest of them are built upon. Uh, William Booth, as we'll go through these doctrines each week, uh, William, you'll come to see that William Booth was actually a really practical fella. He was pretty, you know, he had a method about everything coming from the Methodist ministry that he did. And so this one is the first one and each of the rest are layered upon that. They build upon it. Our first statement is simply this. It's on the screen with me that we believe that the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments were given by inspiration of God and that they only constitute the divine rule of Christian faith and practice. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? Yes? Yes, thank you, officer. Appreciate that. You know, the Salvation Army firmly believes that, it is all, uh, that all Scripture has been given to us as a gift from God. It is His inspired Word to us, meaning that it is God-breathed. It is His Word given to us to give us hope and to give us reassurance, to, give, to motivate change within our lives. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. All 66 books of the Bible are given by inspiration. 39 in the old and 27 in the new. William Barclay, who wrote plenty of commentaries and plenty of books, he wrote in this book called The Salvation Story Guide. Here's a quote from him. This is what he said about it. 
that the books of the Bible did not become Scripture by the decision of any church or man. They became Scripture because out of them, the readers in their sorrow found comfort, in their despair, hope, in their weakness, strength, in their temptations, they found power, in their darkness, they found light, in their uncertainty, faith, and in their sin, they found a Saviour. These 66 books that we have available to us, and this, what we call a Bible, is referred to as the canon of Scripture. Now, canon comes from the Greek word. Can you guess what it is? Canon. There you go. Pretty simple for you to understand. And it simply means read. Canon, it's spelled slightly differently. It starts with a K. But it means read. And I'm sorry, council, but I took this read out of the uh, Torrens River this morning. Um, but I did cut it right so it would regrow. Um, because a reed was once a measuring rule or a ruler or a measuring stick uh, of the old age. And so our scriptures are what, we, uh, and it, are what we, we measure our Christian faith and practice by. What I mean by that is that it's our ultimate guide uh, for what we believe, that's our faith, and what we do, which is our practice. William Booth said that our creed is the Bible. Our work is to publish the gospel and we are welcome as co-workers, all who hold the word of God as the standard of faith and practice. As co-workers who hold this scripture in this light, we must allow it to surpass all of man's authority. Any church tradition that we hold so tightly to or even especially our own opinions. It must transform us. We don't transform it. And when we say this, when we declare it, when we believe it and when we live it out, we actually stand alongside those reformers of old who said, sola scripture, by scripture alone. That's what is important. And that's why it's our number one doctrine, our first, which everyone else is built upon. Scripture alone is authoritative. It is the divine rule. You know, there's this tiny little piece of uh, Scripture uh, that's found in Acts 17, 10 to 12. That has been so encouraging for me as I research the Bible, as I look it up and as I study it. And I wanted to share it with you. It comes from at one point on Paul's second missionary journey when Paul was in Thessalonica. And he was travelling around and with a guy by the name of Silas. And things weren't going well for him in Thessalonica. And some people were up in arms about his teaching and things in the streets. People were going riots and, you know, probably throwing tomatoes at him, whatever else. They wanted him out of there. And so as night came, the believers who were there in Thessalonica sent Paul and Silas away to a place called Beria. On arriving in Beria, and this is where we pick up the Scriptures, they went to a Jewish synagogue now it's said that the Berean Jews were more of noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the good news with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day. To see, they examined the scriptures every day to see what, if what Paul said was true, and as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek uh, women and men. You think about that that these people received the good news and then they went away and they examined it and they came back. That to me is encouraging. That they weren't simply prepared to take it at face value. They weren't simply just gonna trust Paul, but they wanted to go and find out for themselves, to research, to think about it, to pray about it, to sit on it and allow it to transform them. They weren't interested in being tossed and turned in the waves or blown here in the wind like it tells us in Ephesians 4, 14. But they took the word of God as authoritative. There's this little song that I know, and I'm hoping you do too, otherwise I'm gonna be really embarrassed. It goes as something like this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, 
They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. How do I know that Jesus loves me? That I have received His gift of salvation, that I am forgiven? Because the Bible tells me so. Romans 10, Paul once again writes here and he says this, the word is near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, that first doctrine, and believe it in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, Anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. Jesus loves me. He loves you. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And God's Word can be trusted. It is a true and reliable witness to God's revelation of Jesus Christ. It is His inspired Word of God through which He reveals Himself to humankind utterly trustworthy, providing hope and salvation and encouraging us through the testimonies that we read in it of transformation. But we do have difficulties when it comes to understanding the Scriptures and why there are, because why there are so many translations. I mean, that's because we are translating things from Hebrew and Greek, an ancient language into English, which is a modern, reasonably modern language. Hebrew and Greek had approximately 7,000 words. Anyone have a guess about how many words modern day English has, according to Google? About 170,000 words. And that's not counting the ever-growing words uh, that that are now obsolete that we no longer use, which according to Google is about 47,000 words that have been created that are no longer used meaning that modern day English is always developing, always changing. I mean, you just think about it. How many words have you learned since a couple of Kiwis walked into your congregation? I know we've learned quite a few more. Can you back up a bit, Chad? Thank you. Anyone know what that means? Yeah, if you were quick enough, you would have read it. This is uh, Hebrew. So I kind of know what it means simply because I found the answer. If we were to translate that into English, and I'm trying to give you a challenge here about why this is so difficult for our translators and why we pick up Scripture so hard to understand sometimes. If we translate that straight into English, we'll see the next one. Does anyone know what the verse of Scripture says now? That's a direct translation. We'll flick the next one up now. It simply says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. You get to see the challenges that they have when we say that this is our divine rule and while you pick up one piece of Scripture, it says something different to the next. Challenges of translating something is very, very difficult and hard work. The ancient texts were read right to left. They had no vowels, they had no spaces between the words and they had no grammar. And so you can see firsthand just by that very little illustration there how difficult it is when it comes to reading the Bible and understanding what it says from its original original words. Another difficulty that we face as Christians is recovering biblical authority in the light of what some people might say is the erosion of all authority. Authority in general is disappearing. Think of policemen walking down the street now. You know, kids yell at them and run away, right? That would never have once happened. Teachers, you know, how often does your class just sit there on the mat and do as they're told? Doesn't happen anymore. They ask questions, they push back. 
What about ministers? Well, I'm not gonna go into that story. <laughs> Parents, you don't have the authority that you once had. These things are changing. Doctors, doctors are never right. You know, they just Google stuff, so we do too. So we don't trust them anymore. They lose that authority. Well, Scripture is losing that authority as well. Children are being taught not simply to take things at face value anymore, which I think is a good thing. But it leaves us with a challenge as Christians. And that challenge is this, that because the Bible tells me so, isn't enough anymore. As nice as my singing and your singing was. Yes, the Holy Spirit makes a transformation in people's lives as they open the text and they read it and, and at times it can be completely miraculous. But more often than not, people will push you back about it because God's Word said in some people's minds is just not enough. Therefore, the challenge that we have as Christians is that our lives must reflect this holy book if we are to say that it has any authority then we must show it. We must be faithful to fully explore any fresh insights that we discover with God's Word, to really wrestle with them. And we must also use those, the truths of the, those, of the Bible that we read, those statements that are evident, the stuff that you read out at the start of the meeting, those, those, those verses that are sticking in your mind, your favourite verses. We must use those as, as, along with the wisdom of our past to help us live authentically as Christians today. That's what people are looking for. And then they'll take the Word of God as authoritative. Each of us responding to the challenges and the pushbacks that we receive in ways that show a good understanding and personal development of biblical faith that are consistent with both the Old and the New Testaments of Scripture we can't just take the old or just take the new. Yes, we are New Testament people living under the grace, but we are informed by the old. And together, it makes us who we are as authentic Christians living in the light of God. We need to resist any, attempt, uh, any attempts to change the meaning of what we read in Scripture for our own purposes. To find, trans, uh, to find a quick solutions, if you like, to things that are going wrong in our lives or things that we need to solve. Or to simply ignore a biblical truth because that's been highlighted to us because it doesn't mention the very topic that we're dealing with today. Some of the stuff that we're facing as Christians today never came up uh, in biblical times. And so we must research and look into and pray and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to find the right answers, to make it authoritative in us. And so I have a task for you this week as we think about this first doctrine before we move on to the second one. And this is this task and it will be really interesting for you. Well, I hope it will be anyway. I want you to take your favourite Bible verse that piece of scripture, that one verse that you know really well, that sticks around with you, that might've been given to you as a child. And I want you to read around that one verse, just a paragraph around each side and explore for yourself what is actually going on there. When, when, when we say that, you know, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, well, who is He talking to? What's happening? Why is Jesus saying that famous verse? Then take that one verse and read it in multiple translations. And if you need a hand with that, I've got plenty of different translations that I can photocopy or loan out to you. But there's also a thing called Bible Gateway, which will really help you on the internet. And while you're doing that and reading at those different verses and seeing what they look like in, in different translations, then I encourage you to share your favourite verse with someone else a loved one, a friend, a neighbour, someone on the other side of the world via email, whatever it might be. But share it with someone and ask them what do they think it means? Because I wonder if what they think it means is the same as what you've always thought it meant. And then as you learn together, your faith will grow. 
You'll be encouraged as you share and listen towards each, uh, to, towards with each other. Strengthened by His Word and as you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal Himself to you and as He guides you into greater faith and practice. And as you allow this Word of God to have true authority in your life, as our first doctrine states. I'm gonna ask Lockie and the team to come back up now. Because the words of this next song remind us of our belief or our beliefs. Beliefs that can be found in Scripture that give us a hope and a reassurance as we put God's words into faith and practice. The words of the song say this, Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Saviour. All found in Scripture. Words that we've come to believe are true. And so I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit that our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus.